Hi, I'm Chris Sarandon, and this is Cooking by Heart, where we revisit the vivid memories of the food we grew up with and the people and the stories attached to that time in our lives. My guest today is Chef Noah Tucker, a native New Yorker now residing in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, for the last 14 years. Noah Tucker knew that he wanted to be a chef from the age of six and is always focused on becoming a restaurant owner and hospitality entrepreneur. Tucker's a Navy veteran and a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. After his military service in school, he traveled the globe, working in New York, Japan, and California, refining and mastering his art, learning and developing his palate in leading Michelin kitchens. Before moving to Amsterdam, where he's owned, created, and developed a number of original concepts, including the most ambitious one, Thai cuisine. Global hospitality entrepreneur, chef, restaurateur, TEDx speaker, Noah calls into question our ingrained relationship with food and drugs from an adult perspective, challenging taboos and laws that have led us to a misguided journey of what's a drug and what is food. With his fellow chef and partner, Anthony Joseph, Noah's new television series, High Cuisine, had its premiere on the Dutch streaming platform Videoland, and they're now creating a series of cookbooks that will ultimately pull together about 100 mind-altering dishes. Noah Tucker, welcome to Cooking by Heart. Thank you. Thanks for the, the amazing introduction. Oh, well, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, how are things in Amsterdam today? Uh, Amsterdam's looking okay. Um, it's a little gloomy, maybe on the borderline of melancholy, but that's kind of <laughs> August in, yeah. in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit melancholy um, here in the northeastern part of the United States, too. Uh, I, when I start the program, no, normally what we, we begin with is provenance, where we're from. And I know that from your uh, TED Talk uh, that uh, where you come from is important in terms of your culinary development. So tell us about where you were born, where you were raised. So uh, I'm a native New Yorker and uh, born and raised uh, from a place called Nurshell. My One side of my family is from, uh, well, so I'm... I'm a bit mixed. My one side is uh, Ashkenazi Jews from New York. Yep. Um, came here in the 1800s, uh, originally from Poland, that kind of space. Ah. Um, whoever was whoever was running it at that time, right? Yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> um, and then the other side is from uh, bootleggers and sharecroppers from Georgia on my father's side. And they came up uh, actually like in the 50s, uh, in the 30s, I should say, or, or earlier than that, in the 30s, right. 40s. Right. Um, both inherently, I, I think, you know, like almost iconically American, right? I mean, uh, you have old, old immigrants, Ellis Island immigrants, you know, right. starting and particularly this Ashkenazi, this really huge kind of European Jewish influx during that time that really sh helped shape New York, Brooklyn, yeah, uh, Manhattan, the boroughs in general, yeah, particularly exactly. that, right? And really yeah. hold a lot of thread still in that space. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to, I've had a couple of guests, uh, Hal Linden and a guy by the name of Manny Eisenberg, a, a, an amazing uh, Broadway producer, both of whom uh, were born up in, uh, were born and brought up in the Bronx. Sure. So I yeah, live just New above City. the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, continue, and, uh, my mother please. was Yeah. So my mother was born in Manhattan. My grandmother and grandparents were born in Brooklyn. Um, we're just, it's, new, it's a lot of New York <laughs> in that Right, household. right, right. And um, on my father's side, um, and that comes with a very particular culture and traditions and, you know, habits and language. Yeah. And, um, you know, growing in, in a Yiddish house, you know, in a <laughs> New York Yiddish household with a little small. She was, I think she was like four, nine on a tall day, my grandmother, you know. Wow. And tough as nails. Um, and, you know, I'd walk over there on a Saturday morning, have my sunny side eggs up, glass of orange juice, everything bagels with locks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, that was pure bliss. That was nirvana on, a, oh. on any given morning. Right. And then go over to my grandmother's house. Same morning. I was a big eater. I still am. Uh, I'd go over to my other grandma's house. It was literally over the hill. And I'd sit down and I'd get grits and fat back and fried fish and wow. biscuits. And so it was such a heavy loaded American, you know, moment that I right. always got, um, that it, and it revolved a lot around family and food and relationships and and hard habits, right? Whether they were healthy or unhealthy. Yeah. Um, sadly enough, but 
more importantly, the experience was there. As I got older, I learned to really value that, that particularly. Um, and then me loving food, growing up in New York, even if you didn't have any of the, the family culture, you get exposed to so much food in New York. Right. Right. I mean, a New York slice is, and it's why I'm not even saying a slice because it's particularly a New York slice. Right. Right. It's not a Nepalese pizza. It's not a deep dish from Chicago. It's a New York slice. Yeah. Um, you know, the Chinese food, the Indian food, the, you name it. It's so deep embedded in the New York culture because how that city particularly has embraced, um, you know, just the food dysphoria a, a, across the globe, that landscape. Right. And, and, you know, really, um, you know, food is like it's on steroids in New York. It's not just a bagel. Exactly. It's, you know, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a bagel with so cream cheese and lox and, uh, and onions everything. and it, the whole refrigerator is on it. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, and then it gets embraced. If they give it a name and then it gets, you know, through two million people buy it and it becomes culture. So I think also growing up in New York with the diverse background and also loving food. Um, it really has just led me down to a path of yeah. just continuously falling and re-falling in love with food as my, my journey goes on. Tell me a little bit about the, specifically about the experience at home. What was it like? Was your mom a, a uh, an adventurous cook? Your father? No. So either I was, of them? I was raised, <laughs> so it's funny enough, I was raised um, from a young age on my mom's side. My parents were, were split apart at a young age, so I lived predominantly with my mother. But my mm -hmm. father lived like a mile away. Right. My mom is still here. I love her very much, but she wasn't the most amazing cook. Mm -hmm. This is not an uncommon story, by the way. No, and this is kind of a, a ongoing joke also in the family of why I became a chef. <laughs> so my mom pretty much raised me vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Oh. From a pretty young age. But my father, you know, my mom thought I was vegetarian until like the age of like five or six or something. And then we went over to my grandmother's house one day and um, I think my grandmother said something like, baby, do you want some fried chicken? And my mother was like, oh, no, no, he doesn't, he doesn't eat that. You know, he's not eating meat right now. And she mm -hmm. was my mom, like, he comes over here every Sunday and destroys <laughs> a plate of fried chicken. And my mother was like, what? Like, what is happening? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think there was, you know, I really got introduced to a, my comfort food is fried chicken and it is brown rice, tofu and, and broccoli. Right. 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 Um, it's, it's really those two hard lanes, and mm -hmm. I've always embraced it because good food is good food. Exactly. And it doesn't matter, you know. Right, right. So I think at home, it wasn't so adventurous on either side, maybe right. more stereotypical to the genre they fell in. Um, but there was good food around me almost from my parents' parents. I mean, everybody right. could cook. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, it was the grandparents who were the, the, the food. And uh, my uncles purveyors. and my aunts. You know, it was, I could always walk, you know, if there was like a family cook at later on in life, the men cooked. Ah, yeah. On my dad, on my dad's side. Yeah. The men, my uncle was in the kitchen. The men were running around, both my uncles in there, you know, kind of, kind of towels over their shoulders and tank tops cooking for everybody. Yeah. What were they cooking? You, you know, if it was a brunch from a family thing or a barbecue or, you know, when we were all just getting together, yeah. it wasn't the women that jumped in the kitchen. It was the men. Mm-hmm. It, you know, everybody was cooking a little bit, but the men were definitely in there sweating. And that comes from my grandfather on my dad's side, my father's father, um, Fred. He was the cook of the family. Oh, interesting. He, yeah, there was there was eight of them uh, in the household. So a 10 person household in wow. a three bedroom apartment in New York. And he was the cook. He cooked two meals a day. Basically, he cooked for 20 people every day. Mm -hmm. And which is like insane, right? Yeah, right. Um, like, like I've, I've had a, I've had a 20 C tasting, like, right. So you learned, you, you learned not only, uh, uh, the, the variety that came with being from a multicultural family, but you also learned volume. Yeah. Right. So interesting enough, I never got to meet my grandfather. He, he passed away a year before I was born. Oh, so my grandmother took over cooking. Right. So I grew up with my oh, grandmother cooking in that very like stereotypical story, but everybody in the family was like, I mean, grandma can cook, but she couldn't cook. She can't cook like grandpa could cook. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> like, that's like a known fact in the family on my dad's yeah. side. It was very like, I know grandma can cook, but nah, not <laughs> anything close. And for me, that was such a statement because I'm like, grandma can cook, cook. Like, how the hell did grandpa cook? So it's also the story how it kind of passed into me as well. 
that it's not surprising that there's a chef in the family yeah. who, who is really taking this as a career. Um, so I guess there's a bit of lineage when it comes to that. Right, right. Now, uh, any siblings? No, I would live by myself with my mother. Right. Yeah. What was the conversation like? Mom was definitely a realist. She's a liberal. She is a feisty, um, you know, kind of New York woman who lived a really exceptional life and didn't bullshit growing up. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a very honest household. There wasn't a lot of um, fluffy kind of like kid lies going around. Right. You know, myth truth. My parents were very, very honest with me. They were very upfront. They really did expect the same. And now, you know, 46, I, I really thank them for that. I had to kind of father that if I got into any trouble, anything good, bad, middle, medium, I called them, I spoke to them, I shared with them. But right. that means like horrible night in Manhattan where I need someone to come pick me up. And he's there at 4.30 in the morning. And yep. all he does is bring me a breakfast sandwich and we never talk about it again mm -hmm. to my highest point. And it's the same thing. He's there and he's like, you let me know if you feel like talking about this. Like. Yeah. I'm just here for you. In your TED Talk, you're talking about your grandmother's food and how it, it, it in a way, was the, the, the sort of conduit to what you're doing now in the sense that uh, it, it created a high. It definitely was a catalyst of my culinary career to showing that, you know, giving your time and giving your effort and feeding people also makes you feel good. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. really on a self-indulgent level, it does make you actually just feel good feeding people on a base level. Yeah. Um, so I understood that and I was like, wow, that's pretty magical. And D just, you know, basically fed 30 people how amazing she feels right now. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side, the dopamine and the serotonin levels, right. Of me going in there and literally as a child feeling elated being in this room where was almost like it couldn't have been more alive. Those right. Sundays were radiant for me. They, they, they filled me. Um, and I think me growing up and being able to have extremely like iconic black moments. Yes. And they were filled with the most beautiful stereotypes, right? Of those. Yep. It really was that it was the cousins, you know, wrestling and the uncles having a cigarette and, you know, jobbing and bullshitting about something and right. the aunts in the other room and the older cousins don't bother me. And grandma cooking, you know, it was, it was so on and live and it was right. so pleasurable. But the glue was food. The glue was food. Yeah. Right. Why were we there? Yeah. And I think it, it immediately made sense to me um, why that was. And, you know, as much as I felt it in my grandma Raz's house, Jewish culture really, focuses on nucleus. Yes. Right? Yep. Where I think black culture focuses on almost like for real your neighbor's neighbor. Mm -hmm. And it's a different type of invite. Now, obviously, this is definitely an economical statement when redlining happened and, you know, impoverished you got to get loans and buy houses and become middle class because before that they were in the projects in Harlem sharing coal Eat, right? Like my right. great grandparents worked at the newspaper stand on Lexington and 125th. Mm -hmm. So when it was all Jewish community, not my father's side. So, you know, I understand the transition, but I was, I'm only part of that transition. So I can only speak for that, right. that moment. Right. And when I, we didn't have big gatherings uh, at my grandma Raj's house, when we did Yom Kippur or Pesach or it was a family. Like yeah. that was it. It was yeah. us. It was maybe like eight of us or nine, you know, nine yeah. of us. The immediate family. Right. Yeah. Like at a table as well. Not like walking around and loud and everybody. <laughs> none, <laughs> right. none of that shit. Right. 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 So the, the community part came from my dad's side for sure. But it was absolutely the glue on either side. It was. That was the 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 medium through which uh, 100%. the communication. Yeah, exactly. Occurred. Now, you also talked about uh, your your dad being a moonshiner. No, my, my great grandmother on my, on my dad's side, ah, so my, okay. great -grand, my great grandmother on my dad's side. Right. And that, that was in the South? Yeah. In Georgia. Uh, her name was Grandma Stella. I grew up in West Virginia, right? And my dad owned a restaurant there and 
the community was very much sort of, um, it was one of the places where the community kind of coalesced. We had, the, the courthouse was across, diagonally across the street from the, from the restaurant, uh, county courthouse. Uh, so there were a lot of pe- lawyers there. Uh, uh, state troopers would come in. The police would come right. in, what have you. And every year, just before Christmas, there was a tradition where there was a guy by the name of Trooper McGraw, who was the captain of the local state police station, who would walk in with a big, a clear jug of some kind of substance, right? You know, gallon jug. There you go. And he walked <laughs> back into the kitchen, and my dad would make moon, uh, moonshine eggnog. Wow. For everybody. And and it was kind of understood because it was a dry state. You couldn't buy liquor yeah. and, you know, you couldn't get uh, a drink over the bar. Uh. So so my dad would make the 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 uh, uh, the eggnog with moonshine and uh, it would be served in paper cups. And everybody who came in, the lawyers, the police, the everybody, Whoever. they all partook. It was great because it was a community thing. And it was also as you I mean, we're kind of tying in to getting a little buzz. Yeah. At lunch, <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. So anyway, 100%. yeah, no, yeah. So she was, she was a moonshiner. Yeah. yeah. Any stories attached to that when you were growing up? Well, I only met her once when I was seventeen, and um, it's quite a long story. But I'll give you the short of it. Um, I went down there with my father and my uncle, who were two very powerful men, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. at seventeen. They're from a different bloodline, and they're just you know they're that old school fifties. Uh, you know, black man. Yeah, yeah. Now, my great grandmother Stella, she sat about five foot. She was probably your complexion with blue eyes and light mm-hmm. hair. Mm-hmm. But she was the blackest woman in the family, and she was just through, you know, her own lineage. Both her parents were quite fair. Her hair became lighter blue. You know, her eyes were blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you obviously she was still. African American. My uncle had lived down there with her when he was quite young and ripping and running, and because obviously she was, you know, a bit of a bit of a, a outlaw in her own space. Mm-hmm. And my father dealt with her when he was in college. Now my father got along with her well, but my uncle didn't have the best experience. Yes and no. So he was petrified when we were going down here, like almost in tears. This is a man that was probably two hundred and fifty pounds of solid muscle, right? And he was shaking in the front seat <laughs> and my father was really quiet and didn't really have much to say. He said, I know what we're just going to, now my father is a very deep man and stoic in his own space. And, um, you know, there's certain people on this planet that, you know, have been touched by God. I don't know really how to mm-hmm. explain it any better yeah. than along. He's one of those people. I'm not mom's grand, but he is one. Yeah. He just walks in his, in his space different on this planet. Right. He was kind of just explaining to me, like, just be cool. Stella is just a different breed of person. She was born in the 1800s. Like she's just different. And you have to understand it meeting her. So we get out the car. Everybody's kind of on their best foot. My uncle hasn't got out of the car yet. He's petrified. He's almost in tears. He gets out the car. The first thing my great grandmother says to him is Trent, didn't I tell you I'm going to kick your ass the next time I see you. <laughs> so you can imagine the rest of this, yes, this, right. this endeavor when we were there. I had yeah. a really great moment with her, <laughs> you know, but this is, this is kind of my grandma Stella in a, in a nutshell. Right. And, yeah. and Stella fulfilled Trent's trepidations to a T as soon as he got out of 100%. the car. <laughs> I love it. A hundred percent. I want to get back to your growing up. Uh, in in New York, and uh, you also talk about as you're growing up that the uh, the the drug world was was there all all the time. It sort of pervaded the culture. Yes, I mean, what were the '80s like for drugs? Right, the Reaganomics, yeah. the crack cocaine epidemic. Right. One was how, as a kid, you're introduced to kind of drugs in general. And not until recently have they course corrected that, right? You had Joe yeah. Camel. We used to remember candy cigarettes. Remember those? Like the yeah, song. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you, you couldn't do that now. That's not I was doing that. Fly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we all were. We all were blow when we blow it out and then eat this yep. the gum. So it was like, oh, let's pretend we're smoking a cigarette and then eat sugar. Yep. What are we doing? Of course, the people are smoking. 
you know, it was just different. You could smoke on airplanes, no seatbelts. It was yeah. right. Like I'm a seventies kid. So, um, it was definitely a lot of the rules and the regs of, of, of culture now was not even thought about. Yeah, exactly. I think your introduction to drugs um, in the 80s, it was more sterile in a strange way, right? It wasn't wrapped with tons of propaganda. It was like, this is crack. This is cocaine. Um, yeah. It's bad for you. Yeah. Which is a cultural, which is a cultural kind, of, kind of manipulation. In my household, my parents were very open and honest with me. So I wasn't scared of addiction. I was very aware of it. Right. They gave me the truth. Like I had mentioned before, yeah, they yeah. didn't just say, don't do drugs. They said, listen to me, you're going to do drugs. Mm -hmm. Let's really have a conversation about this. Right. And I'm going to tell you what drugs we've done. And I'm going to tell you what they did to us. Mm. And then you can take that information instead mm -hmm. of this bullshit that's on TV that they're not yeah. telling you anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when somebody introduces you to this, you can say, you know what? I have a story already about this and it doesn't sit with me well. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you. Yeah, which is a much more visceral way of 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 getting the message across that uh, there's sometimes this stuff that's not good for you and it's going to ruin your life. Have faith in your child's intelligence. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. We don't lie to our kids. And I know that is such, you know, people say it all the time. You lie to your kids all the time about anything so that you just don't have to explain shit or they can understand it. No, I don't lie to my children. Mm -hmm. I will uh, listen. I will lie to my mom, my father, my wife. I'm not lying to my kids. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't want yeah, yeah. that relationship. My parents didn't lie to me. I don't want to lie to them. Yeah. I love it. So if they ask me a question and they have the chutzpah and the knowledge to ask me that, I'm going to answer it. How mm -hmm. dare I lie to them? Yeah. And that's how I was brought up. So I think when it came time to do something like, and we'll get to the McDonald's story, is when I was young and we were experimenting, I started smoking weed at quite a young age, maybe 13, 14. Um, but uh, I didn't, it didn't, it wasn't a gateway drug. I just smoked weed. Right. Um, and <laughs> that was it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, later on, 15, 16, whatever age it was, I started to try mushrooms and other stuff. Um, and growing up in New York in the nineties and being, you know, in your teenage years, it wasn't so crazy to try stuff like that. Right. Um, especially in comparison of what 15 and 16 years are trying now. Yeah. You know, we're into fentanyl and uh, it's yeah, bad. It, what? Yeah. It's, it's a different bag of tricks. Yeah. You know, we were, st we were being raised by hippie adults. Right. So, you know, psilocybin was something that was a conversation. And we would go to McDonald's and get cheese. We had burgers and we'd take mushrooms and we'd stuff them in the burgers. Mm -hmm. And that's how we would take our mushrooms. Right. Mm -hmm. So back to, again, this connection between food and drugs and this connection point, it all kind of is still rotating in my life. Right. Right. But you also, you also talk very specifically about the fact that through history, that every culture has had a, a relationship with drugs in one way or another. And that 100%. the naming uh, uh, of substances does not necessarily connote what their what their effect is and the uh, effect on your body chemistry. I mean, you 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 mentioned, sure. for instance, that the, this combo of the mushrooms, but you were also getting nitrites. You were also getting sodium in this burger. Uh, these are e also substances. Twenty five, seventy two. Yeah, yeah. It's more than just. It's compounded, right? And and I think one is clearly more dangerous than the other. And I think we have that mixed up. And that the effect on the brain is is not just from the drugs that we think of as being illicit, but also things no. that we add normally to food. A hundred percent, especially when, you know, especially, I mean, you know, in the instance of trying it with fast food, that's a different subject and you're a teenager, right? So you're like, you're curing an addiction to whatever the product is in the fast food. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Like we were addicted to fast food as kids, right? That's yeah. why you went to McDonald's. It was like, right. I want the sugar and the sodium, everything we just spoke about. Yeah. So your body is behaving already in a certain way, right? You have heavy dopamine and serotonin drops. So you're already elated and then you're taking psilocybin. So it was like a very euphoric, interesting high. We were mm. very comfortable. Mm -hmm. I think people underestimate the experience when you're taking a foreign substance of where you're, where you're, where you're at, um, when you're taking it and yes. what, in what capacity, what mental state are you when you're taking it? Right. Yeah. Right. 
I constantly think about that. Most of the times when you take any type of drug, you are, as a grown up, right? Most of the time, if you're out in a social setting and you take a drug, you're in a bathroom, you're in a corner, you're in an alley, mm -hmm. you're somewhere already telling your, your brain, your psyche that we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you're doing the drug. So you're in a wrong space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was always very conscious of that. And I'm very forthright with any drug use I take, obviously. I, I don't want to hide it. This goes back to the end of my childhood about being honest. I don't want to mm -hmm. feel bad about the things I do, but yeah. I won't do them. My drug intake is deeper than just cannabis and psilocybin. It's sugar, it's nicotine, it's caffeine, it's whatever, right? It's a multitude. The list is long. and Yeah, alcohol too. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Every single celebratory moment, we involve alcohol. Yeah. But you can't tell me a celebratory moment that we're elated about something and alcohol doesn't pop up and we're toasting to it. Yeah. Along with sugar, right? I mean, if you want to, what sugar is happening, it's insane. Uh, it's, the, it's the only drug that will allow pregnant women to take and babies and children. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unreal. And mm -hmm. this is just legislation, right? Like this is just, this is just politics and lawmakers and, and people who are putting money in, you know, the favored places to make sure things are, you know, working the way they wanted to. Right, right. You know, it could easily be done for any of these drugs at on any level. I mean, right. at some point, Coca Cola would literally add cocaine in. Yeah, I think it's nineteen fourteen, nineteen oh three. The the date escapes me. Mm -hmm. And then they replaced it with caffeine, caffeine. and sugar. That's what yeah. they replaced cocaine with. Yeah, right. And sugar. Half the bottle is is refined sugar. Mm -hmm. So I think. When, as we're growing up, as we start to experiment in our life in general, I think where we all have been there before, this, this weird line starts to form. And I, you know, it, it's my belief that it, it, it doesn't come from an internal place. It comes from an, an exterior vision of people and influence uh, that are prescribed to you, right? When you sit down and you have a 19 bottle of 1983 Petrus with Wagyu and caviar, um, you know, with a foie gras sauce, none of that shit is healthy for you. It's all going to kill you. You mm -hmm. eat it every day, yeah. right? So yeah. it's clearly not nutritional. So it's not food. It's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's a drug, right? Like we're in the drug space now. We're elated. We almost have like sweats, right? You're, it's so nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't even know how, right? It's euphoric. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about when you go into a, when you go to a Michelin restaurant, that's what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you've been to a Michelin restaurant. I'm sure you've had experiences where you're like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like this food, this wine, this pairing, it's amazing. I don't mm -hmm. even, like, there's no other space I want to be in. And you're high. You're literally high. Yeah. And we tend to have this disillusion that they're different. And they're not. A drug is a drug. It has a space. And I think the problem is that we make it, in, it's a bad space that we keep it in. Mm -hmm. Which is just not okay. Because once we switch over the food and there's drugs in it, it's a good space. <laughs> right. Which is so, like it's so crazy, yeah, yeah. you know. So what you're what you're saying essentially then is that the the uh, effects that we're looking for, be they euphoria or um, uh, whatever it is that we're 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 seeking when we go to say a Michelin restaurant, that what is it that you're attempting to do in blending the the what we call the illicit drug world with the food world. Sure. I think I'm trying to blur the line. That's probably more of my uh, mission is yeah. to make sure that when we sit down or when we're more ingesting or even viewpoint, right? It's not so literal. It's not the sit down at the table. That's too, you know, this is more the viewpoint of how we are constantly on the subjective kind of very harsh uh, uh, almost viewpoint and being, um, you know, I think just, just very, very, uh, opinionated, um, to where if I'm sitting next to you and I'm drinking a beautiful rosé, right. Yep. From Nice mm -hmm. and someone sitting on the other side of you and they're smoking a joint that one is clearly viewed different. Mm -hmm. I think all of that gets mixed into this very big, Space where we don't know how to define it anymore. Mm. We we don't know what's right. We don't know what's wrong. Le legal, you know, legislation in America has made it to where in New York, I mean, weed is sold everywhere right now. 
It's in every shop. It's on every corner. It's everywhere, everywhere. California, it's everywhere. Yeah. So what's it? That's just legislation. So then what? It needs two generations to where it's now normalized and we don't view it like that. Mm -hmm. But that means that all of this is bullshit. Right? Like Mm -hmm. now, it means that it's nonsense. It means that we're allowing certain legislation versus our own viewpoint and judgment to control how we think. Mm -hmm. Which is which is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, In in my in my in in my frame of mind. Obviously there's there's a point of legislation, but (laughs) we have to be able to make our own judgment calls in life. Yes. But and if if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying as well is that when we place ourselves in a negative state, when we're imbibing anything, I mean, I do it. For instance, I have high cholesterol. Okay, I take sure. a statin to control my high cholesterol, uh, and when I'm eating certain foods, I'm thinking, "Oh man, I'm really loading the the saturated fats in my system. I'm clogging my arteries, and it puts me in a negative space." Exactly. Exactly. And it also, it, you know, it's funny. It's like, you, so that's also a good one. So we're, as you're, as you're ingesting food, let us say we know it's not healthy for us, right? It's clearly not. Mm-hmm. We could probably be eating not the steak. That's the, the you right. know, that, yeah. that's got the great marbling. Instead of the white bread, we should be eating high fiber, whole wheat bread, whole grain bread. Right. right. Exactly. I'm a, I'm a nice about that. White rice, eating a, a barley. I'm a, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. So, you know, I think that there's something that we have to understand about addiction Mm -hmm. because we underestimate the power of our brains in terms of addiction Yep. and how we can sneak it in and how we would, we are constantly like, ah, it's okay. Like, don't worry, it's just a time Mm -hmm. versus what a drug is and how we perceive that. And when I'm going for the chocolate that's in the cabinet or the juice that's in the fridge, I just want sugar. I'm just addicted to sugar. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that's OK because it's so normalized. And we just need to make sure that we judge and we. We really understand what this this world is telling us in terms of what is OK and what is not OK. You know, psilocybin mm-hmm. is the best antidepressant on this planet. Mm-hmm. I will never go to my doctor and say, give me a little white pill that the pharmaceutical companies have said OK. from." Mm-hmm. It makes no sense to me. The earth put it out there. It's, it's regularly available. It's, there's tons of knowledge on it. You can dose it properly. It's nothing new. Right. Just us as Western cultures decide to ignore it, something that's been around for three to 5,000 years, and say, you know what? I'll go with the little white powder in the box. I want that. That makes me feel better. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make me feel better. But on top of that, I think the way we take it, the way we introduce it to our system is so important. And now I know a lot of these, you know, in our case, ingredients, they're always told to use on an empty stomach because it's about a very spiritual voyage. And this is fun for us. We wanted to have fun. I want to have adult fun. And there's two things that I love. I love food and I love drugs. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that. And I think that's a really like hard statement for, for grown up folks to say. Mm-hmm. But I think most adults do love drugs and they love food. Look at the picture behind you. Yeah. Like coffee cups. Yeah. Like literally. Yeah. So. <laughs> We love drugs. We do. I don't care how you want to tell me. And we love food. They're just so mixed at this point. And the the food companies have, they're such geniuses. Um, You got to give credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. That they've made it one big breath of air that we take in. And we're like, did I just even eat sugar? I thought Mm -hmm. I'd eat something healthy. We don't even know anymore. Right. So I'm just not signing up for that. Initially, when you moved to Amsterdam, you were you with your with with uh, with Tony? Is that t- uh, your partner's name? Tony's from London. He was out here already. Right. Uh, he had been out here like three or four years prior to me meeting him. Right. Uh, raising his kids. La la la. But you had conventional restaurants in Amsterdam, correct? I came out here and I met him like my first year. Yeah. And then we immediately partnered up and started to open up restaurants. Yeah. Once that happened, our first restaurant called Fresh spelled like in French. Oh, right. fresh mm-hmm. and small 35 seater. And that's when we started to test it. And that's when I started to kind of, you know, really say, you know what? I mean, we have our own restaurant. It's doing quite well. I have a little mental space now that I'm not worried about the business. Let's start to explore a little bit. And there's all these smart shops in Amsterdam that sell just tons of legal drugs right. from all over the world. Uh, explain, explain to my listeners and my viewers what a smart shop is. 
So a smart shop uh, in Amsterdam is a place where it's a store, it's a retail store that they sell probably upwards of like 3,000 different types of plants, barks, roots, seeds, uh, liquids, powders, Mm -hmm. all natural, all organic, nothing manufactured, uh, ingredients from all over the world, Mm -hmm. drugs from all over the world. Some of them are psilocybin that you come from truffles or or, or mushrooms, Mm -hmm. and then some of them are just dream drugs, right? Um, Like Mexican tarragon, you know, so very wide range. Cannabis as well? No cannabis. There's no cannabis in these shops. So that's a separate type of place ah, called the coffee okay. house. And they sell only cannabis in there. Gotcha. And these places uh, that are that are smart shops only sell those ingredients with no okay. cannabis. It's a different gotcha. license. Right. And they also don't sell any alcohol. Uh, they normally don't sell any food. It is mm-hmm. a particular license for that. Right. So I started to go in them. First four months when I got here, I was waiting for my, my visa to, uh, sorry, my, my residency to come through. So you're kind mm-hmm. of just like in limbo. Um, well, I had a blast. I went to every coffee shop. I went to every smart shop. Um, I figured like, listen, I'm, I'm 30. I I have nothing to do right now. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for my paperwork. The wife is working. Mm -hmm. Go have a blast in (laughs) Amsterdam. (laughs) Right, right, right. So I did. Um, and it was great. I think, you know, it was, it was a, a full learning experience to go into a place where one is normalized. So now it's going to everything that I believe in. It's not taboo, right? It's like, no, 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 no. This is what it is. Yep. It's all, there's a bunch of information. There's dosage, there's history. There's someone that has knowledge about it there. You can and track legal. where it's from. It's legal. Yep. It's legal. It's tolerated. Yep. Right. Legal is a strong word in the Netherlands. Cause like weed isn't legal in the Netherlands. It's tolerated. Okay. Yeah. It's like, it's like Jay, it's like jaywalking. I don't know how to describe it. Right. Mm-hmm. Misdemeanor. It's not even. Not even a misdemeanor. You got a bad cop, it's a misdemeanor. Most of the time, no one cares. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But the smart shops, what was interesting is that you really could go in there and you could find out what everything was. So it wasn't just this weird moment of like, oh, look at all this stuff. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I want to feel like. This is how long I want to feel like it for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they had information. So I immediately took that. And I took the, the, the halibut that we had in our kitchen, or whatever it was, and we started to play. Um, I started to invite people over on Friday nights um, after we closed at about 11 o'clock. And they would sit at the, you know, the bar, the, 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 the kitchen pass. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would cook up like three courses, four courses. Everything would be microdosed and everything for full vegetarians to meat lovers to whatever. We did a, right. it was quite a mix just tasting explain just briefly microdosing in terms of just how you're you're titrating the the amounts so for us you know i think the general term of microdosing is just taking a very small amount of a controlled substance consistently uh to in, in my case to improve your your mental status or physical right. status so you're not you're not looking f- to get people completely baked and uh, no, out of their minds all. you're you're essentially let's say you know, somebody tells you to take, they'll, you buy a 15 gram bag of magic truffles. Mm, mm. And they'll say, take all 15 grams to be on the moon. We'll give you two. Two grams. Okay. But we also give you about six to seven other drugs in that tasting. Mm-hmm. Per course? Per dinner. So oh. eventually we turn that into a, a seven course dinner. Uh, basically anywhere, you know, we first, we first started to experiment with three and four. And then we did a, a six and an eight course. And then we found a really nice medium about five courses with an amuse. How do you test the, 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 uh, the dosages in terms of what you're giving people? We found methods of understanding like, okay, we actually had people fill out a questionnaire, first off, um, about what they thought their drug use was. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you'll ask somebody like, oh, are you an avid drug user? And they'll be like, yeah, I am. And then we, I want to know what that means. So they'll say, you know, like once a year I go to a festival and I do uh, ecstasy. And I'm like, so you're not a avid drug user. Right. You do it once a year. And then it's right. like, do you smoke cigarettes? No. Do you smoke cigarettes when you're drunk? Yes. Okay. See the difference here? Right. Yeah, yeah. So what are we talking about in terms of drug use? I need to know your drug use. Like, do you do this weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly? What's your... So we would go through a pretty decent... And then we would we'd learn to microdose for each person and their kind of level of intake. Mm-hmm. So we could, 
we could take a table of 10 people and dose separately for each person. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And we would chop it up in basically three sections of mild, medium, and a heavy user. Right. And then we could dose these people in a particular way. Now we, you know, through trial and error and through, I, I, listen, I took everything multiple times that, that we would try. So I also mm-hmm. dosed it on myself a lot. Mm-hmm. Tony didn't take any, he doesn't take any drugs. He has a drink now and then, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was always the control. So there was always a level of like no one taking anything. And then yeah. myself, someone always taking something. Yeah. So it was a very easy kind of progression in finding out like, Oh, whoop, more than two grams of psilocybin. You're not going to finish your dinner. Like yeah. da, 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 after <laughs> right. X amount of milligrams of cannabis. Yeah. You're so you're high as a kite. You're not going to get through the first course, you, yeah. you know, or you're going to, or you're going to eat everybody else's dinner. You, right. Exactly. <laughs> and then, but that's, that's literally how we learned to dose. Right. So it wasn't mm-hmm. just, Oh, let's put psilocybin first and cannabis next, but right. it was first, let's split cannabis up. So let's split it into CBD. Let's split it into THC. Let's split it into THCV. Right. Which like stops your money. You're not making hash brownies. You're creating high uh, haute cuisine, but you're calling it high cuisine. Exactly. And I think this is where it comes down to about breaking down the taboo. Mm Because we all know what we feel like when we sit down for a tasting menu. Mm -hmm. You're elated. You're sitting down. You're ready to be served. You're going to have this beautiful orchestrated dinner. You're not going to have to ask for anything. One course comes. It gets cleared. Wine, pairing, poop, poop, poop. It's a show. Yeah. That's very easy to engage with. I mean, it, it requires almost no engagement. <laughs> Literally, mm-hmm. you sit down and enjoy yourself. Yep. So we knew that food could be the medium. Instead of just telling people to microdose themselves through it and just be like, oh, drink water. It was like, no, 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 no. We're going to serve that cannabis with langosteen. Mm-hmm. And we're going to serve the, you know, the truffles, the magic truffles with white truffle. Mm. And we're going to, right? So all of a sudden, you start to say to yourself, this is... This is, I've never heard of anything like this. Mm-hmm. And then your brain kind of tells you, why, why am I not taking it like this all the time? Mm-hmm. A- as you're, as like right now, you're like, yep, that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm going to take something, why don't I take it with something I really love? Right. So that it's an olfactory, olfactory and taste and, and also an experience that is more. Almost, it's, it's more cerebral in my, yes. well, no, it's, it's just more Euphoric. cerebral, right? It's. It is, and it's making you connect with, with nostalgia, your your familiarity with the experience of dining, because that's nothing new. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's this nuance. So it's it's really a full circle. Right. And uh, so we start to put, we start to test, and we start to videotape, make a trailer, treatment, boom. We start to shop it around. We, we really felt like we hit, like, original gold. Mm-hmm. No one is doing this. No one's talking about it. Right. Every time we bring it up, people are like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> Mind you, this is seven years. This is seven years ago. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So not now in a space that we live in that psilocybin is normal in the north, you know, northwest and nowhere. Yeah. So we start to shop around. We go to Netflix, Amazon, you know, you name it. We, we start to shop around. Everybody loves it. This is amazing. They bring it to legal and compliances. Legal shuts it down immediately. Mm-hmm. Every single, they're like, there's no way we're promoting drug use. I'm sorry. Right, right. And we were like, we're not promoting drug use. It's a documentary on our experience. And they're like, no, you're literally, you're throwing truffles in your mouth on the middle of the screen. We can't Mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. Then we come out here and we're like, all right, America said no. Let's go shop in Europe. We start to shop in the Netherlands first. Videoland and RTL, which is basically like CBS and Netflix of out here. Mm Mm-hmm. They pick it up. And they were like, "Let's do it. Let's let's give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Let's let's do a, a series. Um, let's do one season." So we end up buying a Range Rover, calling every single person that we knew, mm-hmm. and saying we're about to drive around the Netherlands and visit all the provinces. Mm-hmm. We go to all the grow houses, the farmers, the truffle farmers, the cannabis growers, uh, you name it. The 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 fish producers, the oyster farmers, we go to everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then in every province that we would go to a, you know, prominent chef, find out what they do regionally, like what's your ingredients, what's your specialty, what's your style. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would also go to any of the grow houses or, or, or regions where, 
you know, it was what whatever was growing there. We take that drug particularly. We mix them. We invite you know about six to eight people for every episode. And it was people along our travel. So we would invite the chef and his sous chef. We would invite the farmer. We would invite the cannabis grower or the truffle farmer. Everybody would sit down. I invite some chef friends. They would come and we would videotape it. And uh, it would be a five course menu. And, uh, and then we would interview everybody after a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, get some feedback um, about what the dinner was. And luckily, all of them went really well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How many episodes did you shoot? Uh, we did six episodes, and now we're hunting for the next one. And it's still very, very taboo when you approach to people. Mm. Like, they still don't know where to place it, even though on Netflix they have Bon Appetit. And yeah, um, I guess our style is just different to where um, we're not just doing cannabis. So cannabis was fine. But because we're cannabis is like one of the baby drugs that are in there. Yeah, yeah. It's you know we had coca plants and like we went pretty hard into paint. Mm-hmm. Now you also mentioned that there are room. right that there are, there are uh, uh, drugs that come from cultures that are historically ancient uh, and that have been used for uh, dealing with PTSD, uh, warrior cultures, etc. Syrian rue is from Egypt. Um, it's a very old drug, and it's a gateway drug that they would use to amplify other drugs when they took it. Kana is from South Africa. Right. And it's a root, and it means, like, to digest. It's quite literal. Um, and it was, that was used by the Zulu warriors when they came back from battle to help with PTSD and, and stomach problems. So, like, Kana, we would have in the tasting. So after we would give you the psilocybin, we knew people would probably be a little anxious Maybe, you know, the mental state would get to them. Mm-hmm. So we would give them Kana in the next course to kind mm-hmm. of calm them down. Right. And that doesn't have any, you know, kind of euphoric right. properties at all. It just calms you down. So even, you know, even through the dinner, it was really prescribed. Everything was so intentional at, at the end game um, of how we really wanted to make you feel. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we really tried to go around the world and pick drugs from all over the planet. From Egypt, from South America, from from Central and South America, um, you know, we really wanted to to show the diversity uh, in the right. menu, right? And also the, to to document the fact that in history, uh, these drugs have been used. It's so regular. I have one final question that I usually ask uh, everyone uh, on the podcast, Noah. I have a feeling that you're going to have a very specific one. And that is, if there's one thing that you remember from when you were young, from when you were in your childhood, um, uh, through your teen years, whatever, um, or an experience yeah. that you can share with my audience of uh, a smell, a taste, a moment in which suddenly you go back to that moment when you were young and it's, it's sparked by a taste or a smell or a meal. Uh, what would that be? Smells are a huge one, which I, which I love how it, how it, you know, makes your, makes your brain fall into complete. Oh yeah. State. Oh, absolutely. It takes me, you know, smells take me back to moments in my life when I was like four years old, five years old. Yeah. A hundred percent. I know if I walk into someone's house and they have a pot of like collard greens going, Mm-hmm. And I can smell like baked goods. Mm-hmm. I immediately become like a nine-year-old in my grandma's house, yeah. for sure. And I think also, I have certain food that's just attached to certain people. Right. That makes sense. Like, yeah, yeah. No Absolutely. matter what context, yeah. Like any smoked salmon, grab locks is my grandmother. Mm-hmm. Any everything bagel, bagel, cream cheese, my grandmother. Yeah. Um, you know, just like this very specific. Um, uh, items that, that I only I that I like that someone owns in my brain. Yeah, uh, uh, and it doesn't matter. I could be in Nova Scotia, literally, and it's still owned by my grandma. Yeah, like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I know exactly what matter. you mean. Yeah, and I think probably everybody listening has the same experience too. Yeah, yeah, and I, it's hard for me to say one. I don't have one because I think maybe that's my disadvantage of me just in love with food. Yeah, that not a disadvantage, by the way. 
Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, right. Maybe yeah. for the question uh, or yeah. so. But I think like when I walk into a, a New York pizza place mm-hmm. and I smell the the flour on the bottom of the pizza oven, mm. there's no other memory that I have. You know, I, I, I'm I a kid. I'm a teenager running through New York. Right. Getting a slice of pizza for, a, you know, a dollar, you know, and I think. Yeah. I also have, it's funny, even when I was young, you know, everybody has like a sick meal. I don't know if, I don't know if growing up you had a sick meal, right? So <laughs> my sick meal was a meatball Parmesan. Oh, uh-huh. oh yeah. <laughs> so my father, my father would bring me a meatball Parmesan. Like I'd be at home sick and that's what uh, he would bring me to eat. Oh uh, yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, those, so now, now obviously I make meatball Parmesan for my kids in the middle of the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Nobody has a clue what the hell they are. Yeah. Um, but I make a red <laughs> sauce and I got dry mozzarella and I got a baguette. Right, and right, right. Make a meatball parm and I wrap it up in tin foil and cut it for them. Oh, how great. I try to share those memories with my kids yeah, too, right? Yeah, that's really important. Very important. You know, I cook with my kids and, and, and my grandchildren, by the way. Right, right, right. And, and it's, right. Those, those are very important moments to have uh, passed on in our lives. I agree. Uh, and with that, Noah Tucker, I, I want to thank you for this a very illuminating conversation um, about uh, yeah, food and uh, drugs and uh, your life and how it's uh, dedicated now to a very specific and particular way of looking at both, um, which I think uh, sure. my, my, my listeners and my viewers will find really interesting. Noah Tucker, thank you. I look forward to meeting you someday. You as well. I hope you're in Amsterdam uh, okay. sometime soon. All right. Take care. Ciao. Bye.